Number two, and here's where we'll spend most of our time. So Jesus controls everything. He empowers every believer. But that's not gonna help these Christians navigate what's happening. Here's the point we'll spend some time on, and that is this. Jesus is gonna provide right out the gate hope to persecuted believers. Jesus is gonna provide hope to persecuted believers. I wanna take us on a journey back 2,000 years. And I wanna give us from our 21st century perspective a glimpse into the relentless attacks on those first century Christians. The year is 49 AD, I'll start here. And the Caesar at the time of Rome was a man named Claudius. Claudius was sick and tired of these Jewish people who worshiped one God, and so he declared an edict or decree that every Jew must be exterminated from the Roman Empire, basically. They're gone. They're out of Rome, they're gone. If they stay, they die. This disgust toward Jews and then Christians continued to the year 69 AD. 69 AD, the Roman leader Vespasian was a man who uh, was tired of the uprising. He was tired of the, of the riots in Israel. And so he orders Titus to come in and decimate Israel. Now, you know, in 70 AD is when the, the temple fell, but it started in 69, went to 70 to 72. And the temple, God's place of honor and worship to the Jewish nation was decimated to the ground. Jesus promised not one stone will stand Upon another, it was decimated. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, we're Christians. That means nothing to us. Didn't mean anything to them. Wrong. Even Jewish Christians still had honor for the temple. They went there as children. They, they celebrated festivals. This is a place of reverence and worship. They were affected when the temple fell. In AD 72, most of the Christians now, if not all, were driven out of Israel into a country called Asia, Asia Minor. So contrary to the wrong opinion, some people think, well, well, John's not writing to Jews in Revelation, he's writing to Christians, Gentiles, wrong. The church in Asia Minor was made up predominantly, for the most part, of Jewish believers who had been exiled from Israel. So you think, all right, here we are, we're in Asia, everything's going good, we could take our, our, our clothes, you know, our, unpack our clothes, we could take our shoes off and rest. Wrong. The dawn of 81 AD brought a new level of hostility that the Christian world had never seen before. The leader at the time, the Caesar, the new Roman uh, authority, was a man named Domitian. And Domitian had such a hatred toward the Jews that it lasted for 15 years. I mean, this man was in office for 15 years. And let me give you a little history lesson of the Roman emperor. When a Roman emperor would come into power, he would claim a city where he would set up headquarters. And this city in the Greek world was called a neochorus. Neochorus just means this city, a place of operation, the place where he worked, the place where he lived. And in this city, he would set up statues and icons and places of worship where people come bow down to him. Are you ready for this? Guess what city of all the cities in the Roman Empire, Domitian sets up post to, to, to honor himself where the world could come see the great leader Domitian. You ready for this? Guess what city? Ephesus. Ephesus. Now, why is Ephesus important? That is the exact same city where the apostle John is the pastor. So you have Domitian moving in and John pastoring in this city. It's also the time period where John is gonna write the Revelation. Every Roman Caesar from that point forward or back to now demanded worship. And this is how it worked. They said, you have to bow down to me as Lord. They didn't mind if you worshiped other gods. That was, that was, everybody worshiped a lot of gods. They had the Pantheon or the Parthenon. They could worship other gods. We didn't care what you worship, but you have to bow down and worship Caesar as Lord. And you had to confess it. You had to confess it as Lord. And what that meant is your allegiance was to Caesar. Why? Because he's the only one bringing power. He's the only one bringing protection, joy, satisfaction, prosperity, and peace. 
So when you confess Caesar as Lord, it wasn't just like, oh yeah, I believe Caesar. No, no, you're saying my allegiance is to him. If you confess anyone else as Lord, hear, hear me out. You were beaten, you were put in prison, or you were burned alive. There, there's story after story of people who were believers who would not confess Caesar as Lord. They were covered with hot wax all over their bodies. They were thrown in boiling water or they were dragged behind horses. You see, here's what I want you to see. To confess Jesus is Lord cost you something because here's what you were saying. You were saying Caesar is not, Jesus is. Cost you something. But the mission in his crazy mind said he had an epiphany one day, and the epiphany showed him that he wasn't just Lord, but that he was actually God, Savior. And so he hated the Jews because he was scared of their God. He hated the Christians, he was scared of their God because he felt like God was mad at him. So he decides to send out a nationwide, a worldwide decree that every person in the empire, imagine America, every person in America has to take a journey to the closest place of worship of, of the temple for the gods, and they have to do something in order to live. National decree. And here's what the decree was. They had to go to the temple dedicated to a Caesar. They had to take a pinch of incense from the bowl. They had to walk to the altar they had to bow the knee, they threw the incense onto the altar, and they shouted out these words, Domitian is Lord and God. Now listen, I don't care what else you believe, he said. You believe in all, you believe in this Jesus, I don't care what you believe in, but you have to confess this out loud. Now, we know that at the time, John was familiar with Paul's writings. And he knew what John said in Romans chapter 10, and all this is gonna make sense. In Romans chapter 10, verse nine, here's what Paul said. If you confess with your mouth, what? Jesus is Lord. Brings it in a whole new light now. It's not walking out, sign a card, raise a hand. No, no. This was a death sentence. If you confess Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So John, here he is, watch this. He's probably in his 80s. He's an older man. He served the Lord his whole life. And he hears about this demand from this evil emperor Domitian and he probably in my mind politely says to him, emperor, I respect you but I'm gonna decline the offer to bow down to anyone other than my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is God and Lord. The mission is enraged with this man. How, he's an old man, just do it and live. And John's like, I, I'm sorry, I can't. The mission calls him a heretic. He is probably beaten for his uh, pushback of the empire and his disbelief and, and him being God and Lord. He becomes an enemy of the nation, uh, of the Roman empire, and they're gonna kill him. But the mission has a problem. Here's the problem. If he kills John, like he's killed hundreds and maybe thousands of others, he has a problem. Why? Because if you die as a martyr in a movement, it actually blows up in a good way. So he knows he can't kill John because the very thing he's trying to end, he'll throw more steam on him or gasoline on. So what does he do? He exiles him to the middle of nowhere on an island of Patmos in a prison cell where he's gonna die from the sun beating on him on the rocks. And by the way, you don't wanna miss next week, John in the prison uh, is experiencing a one-man revival of worship. And some of you are gonna love this because you're in a prison now. And I wanna show you, don't us underestimate the power of a prison that God could turn into a revival, amen? Uh, so John's in, on this island being persecuted. I didn't know about persecution before I went on my first international mission trip uh, back in 2005 with uh, David Platt. Um, 
David had asked me and uh, Rob Wilton, a friend of ours, uh, to go with him to Indonesia. Uh, I didn't know much about Indonesia, but I had learned from studying 85% roughly of the country Muslim. Out of those 85%, 15 roughly percent militant jihad Muslim fight, die for the faith they believe in. And we were asked to come preach and teach students who are gonna travel, some of them two to three on a motorcycle from all over the country to come learn how to preach and teach the word of God for a week in one of the very few Christian seminaries. I don't know who this guy is, but <laughs> <laughs> he looks familiar, but I don't remember him. But anyway, yeah, that's me, another life. But uh, on the last day of training, this is the group that we got to teach uh, men and women how to teach, communicate the word of God. And on the last day of training, uh, I looked over at Rob and I said, hey, let's not teach anymore. I think we've taught enough. I wanna hear from them. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. I wanna hear from people who are on the ground, living out the faith in a way very contrary, different to us in America. And so I wanna hear from them. I wanna hear what it's like to live in, in an Islamic controlled anti-Christian community, and I was blown away by the stories of persecution. Uh, one man got up in his mid-30s, he, he grabbed the mic and he said, uh, pa Pastor Robbie, Pastor Rob, thank you for coming. And then he said, uh, after I gave my life to Christ, he called me to be a pastor. And here's what's crazy about these men and women. They all, most of them came to faith in Christ through dreams and visions. Which abnormal, it really rocked my systematic, theological, westernized, Bible Belt idea of salvation, right? And what was abnormal to us was normal to them. And he said, Isa, Jesus visited me uh, in a dream and I knew I was gonna be a pastor. So I started a church and right when we started to gain some momentum and see people baptized and saved, he said, the local group uh, of Islamic men came and they burned my church to the ground right in front of me. And two weeks later, they burned my house to the ground. And he finished and he said, but, but Pastor Robbie, Jesus is worth it. Had a lady in her 20s, she, she had a limp when she walked. She came up to the mic and she said, hey, Pastor Robbie, I want you to know when I confess Jesus was Lord of my life to my parents, my dad, who's a part of the community there of Islam, he said he literally got up from the kitchen table, he, he took a chair and he broke the chair over my back. One of the things I learned from being there is that every one of these men and women lacked material possessions. They had little to no family support, but what they made up for it with was a joy in the spirit of God that I had never experienced before in my life. And they said over and over in different ways, but they said over and over this testimony. Pastor Robbie, we lost everything in the world, but we found Jesus and Pastor Robbie, Jesus is worth it. That's what they said over and over. Friends, listen, in Indonesia, like many countries overseas, there is no separation between your private life of faith and your public life you live. When you say Jesus is Lord, you are saying Mohammed is not. And that's what Jesus is doing here for these believers who are under intense persecution in the first century. He's showing them, let me show you what's happening in the supernatural realm that you can't see with your own eyes. And he's gonna show us in the weeks ahead. He's gonna show us, listen, our enemy is not the people we can see attacking us. These are individuals who are being held captive by the devil, the beast, and his henchmen. Our enemy is not our brother and sister made in the image of God. And what that means, I want you to hear my heart on this. What that means is that our enemy is not the Democratic Party. Uh, listen, our enemy's not Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden or even Donald Trump, wherever you land on, on, on that spectrum. Our enemy is not a person in office. It's not a person of another race. It's not a citizen of another country. Our enemy is Satan and his minions who have paralyzed people in bondage to sin. Do you get it? You, you gotta get this, right? This is what I want you to see. This is why love and compassion to people who are made in the image of God is necessary in spite of what they believe, 
in spite of where they were born, in spite of the political party, party they are a part of, in spite of the country they live in.